Alleluia, Alleluia, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Alleluia. Yeah, okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can barely hear Hallelujah. some of you all. Hello, there you are. Hallelujah. <laughs> Saints of the Most High. Your heart. Hallelujah. Let us begin this day uh, as we turn our attention towards Jerusalem for the Shabbat Seder. Um, if you would kindly join me uh, this Shabbat Yom. Um, as we bow our heads and humble our spirits before the Most High, as we begin uh, this Shabbat of Seder opening up. Hallelujah. Yah Chai. One moment. There's a little feedback coming through. If you could kindly mute yourselves, uh, those who have gotten feedback coming in. So, yeah. Um, it's going to wait for just a few more seconds for uh, some of the people who are chiming in. Um, and so, let us, uh, hallelujah. There we go. There's a few more chiming in. All praise be to the Holy One of Israel. And, and so I heard some conversation and discussion going on as we were beginning to assemble, uh, or as you all were actually assembling. And uh, I will, during the course of the discussion, I'll briefly touch on that uh, question, but I do want to address it a little bit more at length um, and in depth for, for those who had the question. Uh, I think it's very important. I think it's very timely. Just We just don't have the the time available to us to for us today right now um, to address that but notwithstanding um, it is nonetheless very important uh, and we will address it so if you would just give us uh, some time maybe not this Shabbat Seder but again upcoming class uh, there's some time for us to discuss that we have a lot to talk about today we have a lot to teach and a short time in which uh, actually the teaching in. Uh, so if you would just be so kind, <laughs> to kind of bear with me. Thank <laughs> you. 
Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Kulam. Hallelujah. Kol Israel. That means to all in Israel. Hallelujah. Praise the Most High. Let us turn now to the book of. Uh, let's start in the book of Deuteronomy, as we always do. Um, you know, we got an order and a structure to things that we do here. And so, if we would go to the book of Deuteronomy. In the sixth chapter, reading from the law of Yahweh Sabaot, Elohe Israel, in the book of the Barim, the fifth book of the Torah, in chapter six, verse four. It is known to us as the Shema or Hashema, which means hear or listen attentively. 
And it reads on this wise. I'll read to you in Ivrit and then in English. Shema Israel, Yahuwah, Elchenu, Yahuwah Echai. Shema Israel, Yahuwah Elchecha, Yahuwah Echad. Shema Israel, Yahuwah Abinu, Yahuwah Echad. Heal Israel, Yahuwah our mighty one, Yahuwah is one. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Turning to the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, hallelujah. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, in verse 1, beginning with the reading of the Ten Commandments, and it reads on this wise. And Yah spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh." your El, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image of any likeness that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, your El, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh thy El in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. Remember the Shabbat Yom, the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Shabbat Yom unto Yahweh your El. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your sons, nor your daughters, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who was within your gate. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Honor your Abba and your Ima, your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which Yahweh thy El is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor. Hallelujah. 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 And hallelujah. So there you are. Hallelujah. Continuing reading through the scriptures, and we are going to the book of Exodus, chapter 31, and we are reading about the sign that the Most High gave unto us as a people, that he set upon us as a sign. It is a sign between Yahweh and his people, Israel. It reads on this wise in the 31st chapter of the book of Exodus, beginning at verse 12. And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say, Surely my Shabbat you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout all your generations, that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Shabbat, therefore, for it is holy, Kodesh, unto you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whosoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done six days, but the seventh is the Shabbat of rest. Kodesh, holy unto Yahweh. Whoever does any work on the Shabbat day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Yisrael shall keep the Shabbat to observe the Shabbat throughout all their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Yisrael forever. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens, the earth, and the seventh day, in the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave Moshe, Moses, two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of Yah. Hallelujah. 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 
you know, Yah himself wrote that for us as a people. You know, no other people on the earth can claim that. No other people can express that. No other people, any place that was written, that Yah spoke to a people from heaven and they heard his voice. You saw no form or no similitude, just a voice speaking to us. And Israel said, Moses, you speak with Yahweh, lest we die. You know, we don't want to speak to Yahweh again. So, continuing on, this great importance, the significance of that is. In the book of Psalms, Tehillim, we're going to the 23rd Psalm. Psalms 23, it is the psalm written by King Dawid, an ancestor of mine, an ancestor of yours, in the 23rd chapter. One of the most profound pieces of work in poetry and psalm written. It reads on this wise, Psalms 23. Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anointed my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Let all of Israel acknowledge and give praise unto Yahweh the Most High by saying hallelujah. 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 Continuing our reading of scriptures, saints of the Most High, as we go into the 91st Psalm, the 91st Psalm, it is a song of great importance. A song that touches, a song of safety and protection. And it reads on this wise. He who dwells in the secret place of El Elyon, or the Most High, shall abide upon the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of Yahweh, he is my refuge, my fortress, my El, my God, in whom I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of your enemy, because you have made Yahweh, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble sometimes, and I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him, and I will show him my salvation. Hallelujah. 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 You know, that is a song of protection, beloved. And in these very difficult and terrible days that we are experiencing, and the days that are prophesied to come forth, you know, we need the protection of the Most High upon us as individuals and upon our children and our families and our loved ones. And we pray that the Most High will protect and preserve Israel through the beginning stages and through the terrible times of the Great Tribulation and as we return to the Promised Land to protect us in the dark and difficult days ahead. One more psalm that we will read as we begin to open up with today's lesson and message. 
We will turn to the 100th Psalm. The 100th Psalm. It is a praise psalm. As we raise up our voices upon high to the Most High. You know, I tell people all the time in Israel, you know, you make a joyful noise. Shout unto Yah with a glory with a glorious thunderous roar of gladness. Let him know that you love him and that you appreciate him and that you are not afraid to praise him in the midst of the assembly, outside the assembly, wherever, as the scripture says, you know, be joyful and glad and praise the Most High. In the 100th Psalm, it reads this way, make a joyful noise unto Yahweh, all ye lands, and serve Yahweh with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that Yahweh, he is El. He is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name. For Yahweh is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures through all generations. Hallelujah. 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 And hallelujah. 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 All right. If you are turned towards Jerusalem, please remain standing or kneeling or prostrated or whatever form you are as we pray, as we go into our prayer and, and salutation as we open up. And so... Let us bow our heads, beloved saints of the Most High, and humble our spirits as we extend our arms to the heavens and we offer up this prayer on the Shabbat to the Most High. Abba Yah, truly and humbly I give thanks unto thee for this day. Behold another blessed, hallowed, and sanctified Shabbat Yom. Wherefore, as we have read where it is in fact written, behold the children of Israel shall Keep the Shabbat, for it is a sign between me and them throughout all their generation. And so, Abba, we thank you for waking us up this morning and keeping us safe and for watching over us and watching over our children. I pray thee that you would have mercy upon us, your people, the sheep of your pasture, as we confess before you individually and nationally our sins and our transgressions, our trespasses against you. We at various times have not kept your Shabbat. We have not kept your high holy days. We have not done justice and righteousness in the earth. We have broken thy Sabbaths, thy precepts, and thy judgments. Therefore, if a man or woman doeth so and keepeth them, they will have life and have it more abundant. Look upon us, Father, your people, the sheep of your pasture, and forgive us of our sins and our transgressions. Forgive each and every one of us and those members of our household who walk not in your way, but impart upon them your Holy Spirit to open up their eyes and give them a eye that they can see and ears that they can hear and a heart that they can perceive. And pour out your Spirit upon your people to turn us around from a way that which we have walked in transgression to you and restore us as we repent and confess our sins unto you and into our proper heritage and estate. And so now, Abba, I ask thee to be with us as we go out and as we come in. Grant us success and prosperity in all that we set our hand to do. Watch over our children and our loved ones, wherever they are, both near and far, and protect them from all danger seen and danger that is unseen. And bring us, in your people, into the bond of thy covenant. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, Nahawah. Now and forever and ever, in Yeshua HaMashiach's name, for the glory of Yahweh the Father, that all of Israel who love, worship, and praise Yahweh say hallelujah. 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 Shabbat Shalom, saints. Hallelujah. Today is the 24th day of the Hebrew month. Uh, actually, we are in the eighth Hebraic month, the month of Bull, known also as Kashvan. It is the 750, or rather 7518 on the Hebrew calendar. 
on the Hebrew calendar. 7518-5776. It is the seventh yom of the week. It is the Shabbat yom. Shabbat Shalom in the Hebrew calendar year 7518. We are in the 150th Yobel or Jubilee, which corresponds to the seventh day of the month of November. 2015, and on Domini, or in the common era of the Roman Gregorian calendar. Again, shalom, shalom, hallelujah. Today's Shabbat lesson and message concerns the law and prophecy of the last days, the law and prophecy of the last days, the coming global economic crash, seals, trumpets, and signs of the times. Seals, trumpets, and signs of the time. If you will get your scripture out with me as we take this journey together, we will begin our lesson over in the Besora, in the book of Matityahu, known commonly as Matthew, in the Besora, chapter 16, verse 1 through 3. There is some additional feedback if you would be so kind to either mute yourself so we can avoid any what they call reverberation. Toda Rabbi. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 1 through 3 is where we will begin today. Now, you've got to put yourself Historically, 2,000 years ago, when the master walked the earth, and think for a moment what the conditions 2,000 years ago were amongst our people who were indigenous to northeastern Africa. In 63 BC, Pompeii and the Roman legions had come into Jerusalem. After taking it, wrestling the land of our fathers away from former occupiers, who were the offshoot of one of the four of Alexander, Alexander who is called great that I refer to lesser, one of the four of his generals known as Seleucus had occupied that region. And when the changing of the guard had occurred, the Romans had come in and so now Israel is under Roman occupation at this time. So historically, we are talking about a series of events that occurred and in the 16th chapter, Yahshua, Yehoshai, is having a conversation with those who question him. There are two factions here in Israel amongst the many factions that opposed him. I want to lay the background here for you first. And the two factions are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. One group represents one faction. The other group represents another faction. It's very critical that historically we understand who the Pharisees were and who the Sadducees were. As we go through today's lesson, we got a lot of scripture to cover. So let us begin. And it reads on this wise. Then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and tested him and asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And Yahshua answered and said to them, When it is evening, you all say, It will be fair weather, 
for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Cannot discern the signs of the times. They were challenging him and his authenticity of being Hamashiach, being the Messiah. And if you know anything about Israelites from the book of Exodus all the way up to this point, and Shaul writes about it also, that there's a certain character about us, a certain thing about us. And what it is is that the Jews or the Yahudim, right, seek it after a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Two different types of people. One group wants to see some form of sign from heaven to validate Mashiach, to validate who you are, them yourself, where the other group, representing Gentiles, simply seeketh after the wisdom of the world, which is something that the Greeks are known for, where, in fact, Israel, true Israel, is always known for, if you be such and such, if you be this, if you be that, show me a sign of who you are. And so, as you read further, if wow. you to do so in the book of Matthew 16, we're in verse 4, and it says a wicked, now notice this now, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and no sign shall be given unto it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Now for those of you who've read this scripture before, and understand this. This is not the first time they challenged Yahshua about his messianicness, if he was Messiah, if he was the one that was sent, and so on and so forth. In the book of in the book of uh, Matthew twelve, the same thing occurs beforehand, and so. What I'm laying here for you is that there are two factions. And this is not the first time that they've challenged him about an all-important issue. And so if we look at this from the natural eye, he responds to them first in the natural. And then he comes to them in the spiritual. And this entire lesson today is predicated off of the principles that Yahshua taught when he taught. Because those who were asking of him were not sincere in the spirit about the sign from heaven. In fact, the Pharisees were the lawyers in Israel, Perushim. They were lawyers. They were strict Torah. That's all they thought about. That's all they talked about was the Torah, the Torah, the Torah, and yet none of them kept the Torah. And the Sadducees, if you read over Matthew 3, where they're first mentioned, and all through the book, you'll come to find out that the Zakudim, right, the Sadducees who considered themselves righteous, just like the Perushim who considered themselves righteous, but what was interesting about the Sadducees was they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Hmm. Two groups, one so-called lawyers and the other ones challenging the Messiah, asking him for a sign. His response to them was this as we get into the lesson. You know, you all say this, that if it's going to be good weather in the evening, you look out in the sky, you look up, in the Western Hemisphere, you see that the sky is red, you say, hmm, it's going to be fair weather. 
because the sky is red. It's simply the sun setting, and there is an emanation of light from the sun going across the western sky, and it is given a certain tone to the atmosphere. And the natural man or woman can look up and say, hey, you know what, it looks like it's going to be good. It's in the evening, the sky is red. In the daytime, when the sun is situated in the east, it says in the morning, you're going to say it's foul weather. So when you get up in the morning and that sky looks exactly the same, the only thing that changed was the position of the sun as the earth is rotating in a certain direction towards it. But the same painting or the same picture that you saw when it was in the west, now you see it in the east, and you simply say, oh, it's going to be bad weather, for the sky is red and threatening. They were doggone hypocrites. Because they had the ability to discern the face of the sky in its changing, but they cannot discern the signs of time the times that they were in. They couldn't tell the people who were looking for the truth what time it was that Rome was in occupation of Israel and these misguided Israelite leadership that were lawyers, Pharisees, and that were unbelievers in the resurrection of the dead were misleading the people and holding them in a state of bondage to the very oppressor. Now that's taught from a completely different standpoint that I know the church and other places teach because they don't take the time to look deeply into the scriptures and what the circumstances of the people were. We were under taxation by Rome. We were subjugated by Rome. We were oppressed. We were a downtrodden and occupied people by Rome. And so you've got these factions within Israel. I'm just going to be a few more minutes with this because I've got to lay this out. Faction of unbelievers questioning the Messiah. Look, look, I need you to show me a sign from heaven that you can prove to me who you are. And he gave them a sign back in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, through the end of that chapter, or rather verse 30 at the end of that chapter. And those who understand the sign of Jonah or the sign of Jonah know that he fulfilled the sign of Jonah because that's the only sign he was given to an evil and adulterous generation. Now I'm asking you the question, what kind of generation is on the planet earth right now in the midst of Israel and in the world that Israel lives in and the world that is in the power grasp of the times of the Gentiles. Is it not an evil and adulterous generation? And where does that put us at in the, the period of time for the last days? I'm going to read that one more time. Just the latter part of the verse. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Signs of the times. Let's turn to the law. We're starting off in the book of Exodus, chapter 49. Exodus 49 and 1. And we're looking at a key, few key things here as we talk about the lesson being seals and signs in the latter days, seals and signs in the last days. And so as we had our discussion for the class, last Yom Kamashi, we went over all of Genesis 49, but Genesis chapter 49, verse 1. And it reads on this way. And Yaakov called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last 
days, the last days. And so you may want to circle that, the last days. And what does, you know, the last days look like? I mean, it just says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to you in the last days. And when you read the verses that follow from that second verse, I think it's all the way down to verse 32 or 33. There's a lot of verses there. You'll find out that each one of these sons, the tribes in which we come from, were given prophetic or prophecies about what would occur to them as individual tribes, the characteristics of each individual tribe, and the traits of each individual tribe. But my emphasis here is on the term, what shall befall you in the And so this term here in English is the very first occurrence of the term, the last days. Most oftentimes, Israelites will use that phrase, and they'll come out of some prophetic book, hallelujah, or they'll come out of some place in the Besorah, in the Gospels, in the Good News, hallelujah, or they'll come out of Revelation. But here we are in the Genesis, in the very first book of the Torah, in the very first book of the Tanakh, it talks about what would happen to us in the last days. The last days. And not only is this a prophecy, but this is a prophecy that's in the book of the law. In fact, it's the very first prophecy about the 12 tribes and what would happen to them in the last days. Turn with me, if you will. Numbers chapter 24. Now, we done went through the Red Sea, and we done went through the waters of Meribah, and we didn't be walking around at Kadesh Barnea lost as we are moving through these scriptures. I'm going to kind of give you a historical and a geographical point of reference of where we are in Numbers 24 when we get there. And we are dealing with Baal Peor and Balak. And all those other false prophets that, look at that, all the other false prophets that come up and oppose us as we're about to enter the promised land. And then, Balak, right, his anger was aroused against Balaam. And because if you remember back in 22, 23, and 24, he tried to get Balaam to curse us. And he told him, I can't curse whom Yah has not cursed. This is before Deuteronomy 26, 27, and 28. Before the curse, we stand chronologically sound. Because some Israelites will say, well, we got a curse. Rock, stop, mute yourself. We didn't have a curse on us then. Somebody was trying to curse us. And a prophet from another nation told him, I cannot curse whom Yah has not cursed. For he is indeed, I'm paraphrasing, he is indeed blessed. And so this person got angry and took up his oracle against us. But what I found interesting here in the same book of the law, only in Numbers, was this, verse 13 and 14. If Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of Yah to do good or to do bad of my own will. What does Yah say? Whatever Yah says, I must speak. And what Yah told Balaam was, Israel was blessed indeed. Now he speaks this. He says, and now indeed I am going to my people. Come, and I will advise you what will happen to this people. And what your people will do to them in the last days. Hmm. What will happen to this people and what this people will do, rather, to your people in the latter days. There's that word again, latter days. The last days, the latter days. Spoken again, where? In the Torah. 
in the book of Bemidbar called Numbers. Hmm. If we go forward into the book, another book of the law, we go forward to the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, in the 30th chapter, I'm rather in the 4th chapter, verse 30, it says, when you are in tribulation, some books read, when you are in distress, but when you are in distress or when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to Yahweh, your mighty one, and obey his voice. So apparently it's from the most. Apparently Israel had walked transgressionally to the most high. And so now... It says here that in the latter days when you turn to Yah, the Most High, or Yah, your Mighty One, and obey His voice, then another series of events would occur. It says, for Yah, your El, is a merciful El. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your ancestors. I think that's very important, that He swore to them. Says he will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to you. So again, something's happening with Israel in the latter days. Now, we just went through three places in the Torah, right, in the law, that deals with the latter days, the latter days, the last days. And it's very important that we lay a foundation because we've got a few more places, two more places in the law. In the law now, not in the prophets. So you go find, and you know this, those who've been studying with us know, you can find prophecy in the Torah. We're pointing to prophecy right now. And the prophecy that the Most High is having us deal with this Shabbat Yom is the last days. What I'm trying to show you, beloved, is that the word of Yah, right, we shall not return to him void. The word covers every aspect of our lives, from the very beginnings of everything that has occurred in the universe. You find in Genesis, we find the very first heaven and earth. You go all the way to the book of Revelation, and as Revelation closes in the 21st and 22nd chapter, you'll find a new heaven and a new earth. This book is a perpetual cycling of the Creator's Word from eternity past to eternity present to eternity future. There is no deviation of His Word. His Word is congruent. We simply need to allow the Word to speak for itself when we read it, when we quote it, and when we study it. And it will not return void, which means it's not going to come back empty. It's going to accomplish the thing that he set forth for his word from everlasting past to everlasting present to accomplish. He will. He is the one that sets this in motion. Deuteronomy 31. I believe it's in verse 19. I stand corrected. I was looking at verse 19, and it's a good verse. We go to Deuteronomy 31, 29. Deuteronomy 31, 29. Starting at, and the key verse is in verse 29 when we talk about the last days, but the backdrop for this starts in verse 24. 31, 24 through 29, and it reads, So it was when Moses has completed writing the words of the law, in a book, right, when they were finished, then Moshe commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, saying, take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh thy El, or Yahweh thy Mighty One, that it may be there as a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stiff-neckedness. If today, while I am alive with you, this is Moses talking, 
you have been rebellious against Yahweh, then how much more after my death? Verse 28. Gather to me all the elders of your tribes, your officers, that I may speak these words in their hearing. I call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside from the way, there that phrase is again, from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days. Why? Because you will do evil in the sight of Yahweh to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. So evil would befall Israel in the latter days. And Jacob said, come gather yourselves to me and I will tell you what shall befall you in the latter days. And Balaam, who had Balak tried to curse you, and he said, I cannot curse whom Yah has not cursed, but that Yah has blessed. But in the latter days, let me tell this people what's going to happen to them and what you shall try to do to them. And Deuteronomy 4 says the same thing. Something's going on with Israel pertaining to the latter days. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And if you would ask most of Israel, right, with no disrespect intended, we're just being truthful here, because that's what we're going to do. That's what we have done. But if you ask most in Israel about what's going on in the latter days, very few amongst Israel have a clue as to what is going on with us in the latter days and where we should be, how we should get to where we're going to be. What are the prophecies concerning the Messiah? Is history and in the latter days of Israel's history, when will the anti Mashiach or the anti Messiah or the anti Christ appear? What is the circumstances behind Daniel's 70th week of years and what happens in the middle of the week? All those things are relative to what is important to you and I and others and everybody that's on this line and everybody that will hear this in earshot whenever they listen to this recording. Because I bear record to you, beloved, not because I said it, but because I, you know this, you can see the signs of the times. And if you're able to see those signs of the times, then that tells you as a barometer where you are in biblical prophecy upon Yahweh's time clock or the sand that's in the hourglass. And I'm telling you that you don't have a full, full hourglass full of sand. Time is running out. Deuteronomy 32 and 29, beginning at verse 28, says, For they are a nation void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Now, pause, because we find out later on in our history, when we had no king in Israel, right, when we had no real leadership, I'm going to simplify it, because we really don't have no king in Israel but Yahweh. And I've told some of these young brothers that they need to, modify or change them walking around calling themselves king this and king such and such. We don't have a kingdom yet. Somebody else paid the price to be the king of the kingdom that is coming. But it says because there was no king in Israel, everybody did what was right in their eyes. And so Moses goes on to say, because we lack understanding, myself included, so I'm going to make this real plain so nobody can say, oh, Brother Prince said, no, I'm talking about all of us. I'm talking about Israel. I'm trying to keep it right within the biblical framework. I'm not ascending myself above, nor am I putting myself beneath anyone. We are on even kilter here, beloved. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of Yah. There's not an Israelite nor a Gentile among us on the earth who has not sinned, as Ecclesiastes said, I know not one. So because we lacked Maveen understanding, you know what I'm saying, Atta Maveen, you understand what I'm saying? Nor is there any understanding in them. 
So Moses goes into verse 29 and says, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Their latter end. Now we must be in a hell of a condition because Moses was dealing with a people who knew who they were, who spoke pure Hebrew, who understood they had just been given the laws. They had just heard the ten spoken commandments. They had been given the testimony. They walked around with the Ark of the Covenant. And these people, our ancestors, provoked Moses to anger to such a degree he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. I just want to let you know who you're dealing with. The scripture refers to us when we misbehave as a stiff neck and rebellious people. And scripture says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So what I'm saying in the beginning, because the last days ain't nothing to play with. Our people are playing games, and some have just awakened to this knowledge of the truth, and they are still in the world. Their behavior demonstrates that they're still in the world. I've seen posts. I've read people's writings. I look every day I'm doing something, either it's on YouTube, Facebook, I'm walking in the streets, I live in the neighborhood, I drive by and I see our people who have this look of zombieism on their face and the foul and filthy words that come out of their mouth is horrible. And the foul and filthy words that those who are claiming to teach this scripture, it's even worse because those who are in the darkness know not what they say, nor do they understand. But those who are in the light should behave much more properly than what I've been hearing. Mm. So this is a one those claim they know. And I ain't talking about those who are righteous and so what she's talking about, Brother Prince, that she said, I did not call, come to call the righteous unto repentance, but the sinners. This is a wake-up call unto repentance. We have to choose our words rightly and speak to edify and with loving kindness draw our people and teach the truth at all times. Because we are in the latter days. You say, well, what are these signs and these scriptures that indicate and prove that we are in the latter days? Well, I want to stay on the course of the latter days now, not just from a law perspective, because we just came out of the law. And see, what I'm saying to you is that law, Torah, 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 instruction, teaching. Torah is divine or Yahwistic teaching. Yah teaching us what's written in his law and his instruction. They're for guidance. And so Torah is now teaching us that the very first mentioning of the Akarit Hayamim, which is how you say the last days in Hebrew, is meaning the very last day, not the last days like so other people want to teach it. When this word come out, it's talking about the last days. It's talking about the very last days of human government. You are in the very last days of the Euro-Gentile governing system that Yahshua, the Messiah himself, in Luke chapter 21 called the times of the Gentiles. Politically, you call it white supremacy. That's what you call it on the natural side. What we call it on the spiritual side is what the master called it. We call it the times of the Gentiles. The church, when they misteach it, they refer to it as the church age. Some call it grace because it's a dispensational period of time. What do you mean, Brother Prince? Dispensation. You all know when we started the class, we went through the dispensational period of innocence in the Garden of Eden. Then we went through the dispensational period of moral consciousness. Adam and Eve had ate of the forbidden fruit, and they were awake. And then all humankind went away, and it fell because there was an inbreeding, and there was a diabolical scheme of 
creating hybrid creatures, hybrid fallen beings that cohabitated with the daughters of men to pollute the bloodline of the promised seed. That happened during human government. And when that government did not do what was right and good and just in the eyes of Yah, he said, the end of all flesh has come unto me. And that was the end of that dispensation period. It happened with the flood of Noah. Then the next dispensational period came at the Tower of Babel, where all the human family was scattered abroad on the face of the earth. And then Yah chose to choose your father, Abraham, which began the dispensational period of the promise. And the promise ran its course and is still in effect. But when that dispensational period of the promise having preeminence, then the dispensational period of law came through Moses. And after Moses, then the dispensational period that comes after that is the period that coincides with the times of the Gentiles to where there's a period of grace. And grace wasn't given to the church. Grace was given to you. Mercy was given to you to get your act together. You got it backwards. And now you to come to the end of the period of mercy they call grace. And grace doesn't mean judgment is not coming. Grace means that you just got more time to get it together. Hmm. You run through a traffic light. The police officer pulls you over. He gives you a ticket. He asks you, do you want 30, 45, or 60 days? You say, oh, I, can I get 60? Yes. Why? It's grace. Grace before what? You meet the judge. So the period of time that's come to the close is grace, mercy is over. That dispensational period ends at the time of the Gentile. Then what comes? The kingdom age. Got to lay it out because everything from the beginning of the Garden of Eden all the way down to the end of the age points towards the millennial kingdom. Pointing towards the millennial kingdom. So my goodness, well, how did I miss that? That's well, you, some people missed it. Not you on this line, but some people missed it. Why? Because they were indoctrinated. They were indoctrinated in the church. They were indoctrinated in the mosque. They were indoctrinated in the Mason Hall. They were indoctrinated in the Greek club. They were indoctrinated as being members of a fraternity or a sorority. They were indo indoctrination is killing us. Indoctrination is killing us. Bear with me. So now if you think for just a minute, and you go and look at what I call, since we're leaving the law for just a minute, and we're going into the book of prophecy, a book of prophecy, we're going into the book of Jeremiah, called Jeremiah. And we're going into the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah in the 20th verse. I believe we're going to Jeremiah 20. Yes, in the 20th verse. And then we'll go to Jeremiah 30, 24. So you just kind of bear with me here. It's just an excerpt of something. You know? And you will eventually, because we're reading through the entire scripture together as a body, as a class, as a community, but it would be a long time for us to get when we get there collectively, you know, like we've been doing on Yom Kamashi. So I took this excerpt out because the Spirit said, go here. So I went here, and what it reads is this. It says in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 20, it says, And the anger of Yahweh will not turn back. It will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. Notice if you went back to the law and you read out of Deuteronomy 20, or rather 32, 28, and it says, This nation is void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise and they understood this. Understood what? then they would consider their latter end. Consider their latter end? Something that they didn't understand 3,600 years ago? Because when Moses pins this in the 15th century B.C., that's about 
35 and a half, 3,600 years ago, I'm doing an approximate, about 3,550 years ago, we had no understanding of what? The latter days. And over here, Jeremiah, who's writing in the 5th century B.C., right? So he's writing, <laughs> and a thousand years after Moses, and he says, in the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. Hmm. And the same prophet goes on to speak in the 30th chapter of this prophetic work in verse 24. If you turn there with me, if you're not, some of you all are probably already there. In the 24th verse, it says, it says almost the same thing. The fierce anger of Yahweh will not return until he has done it. Done what? And until he has performed the intentions of his heart. In the latter days, you will consider it. Hmm. In the latter days, Israel, you will consider it. Those of you who read Yahu, Jeremiah chapter 30, you know Jeremiah chapter 30 from verse 1 all the way down to verse 7, especially verse 7 says that this is the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And then in the New Testament or the renewed covenant, the Besorah, it refers to it as the tribulation. And a lot of the brethren, especially Israelites from our community or Israelites that are messianic or messiah oriented understand the last days and how it lines up with the tribulation because y'all not finished with us yet and i'll get to that when we get to the book of daniel chapter 9 because some things have what do you mean you have to understand it in the latter days you will consider it in the latter something you got to consider israel in the latter days hosea the prophet Hoshua, chapter 3. Very important piece of scripture here that Hosea writes about concerning you and our fathers in the last day in chapter 3. And one of the most, I think, profoundly organized pieces of work. You know. And I want to ask you this question when he talks about you know, in the latter days, you can consider it, or you should consider it. That again, where are we in the latter days? You know, Hosea is not that long. Third chapter is not long. Very short. Very short. But in verse 4 of the third chapter, it says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice or a sacred pillar, without an ephod or a teraphim. And afterwards, after these many days, the children of Israel shall return and seek Yahweh their El and Dawi their king. And they shall fear Yahweh and his goodness in the latter days. In the latter days. A piece of prophetic utterance is here. And what's interesting here is that this prophet, I didn't take it out of order on purpose, but I want you to know historically, Hosea or Hoshua writes 300 years before Jeremiah. And the theme of his book is the redeeming love of Yahweh towards his people. He wrote primarily to Yisrael in the days of King Uzziah. He's writing in the same period of time that Yeshayahu, Isaiah, the prophet is. Just like Isaiah's father, who is called Amatsiyahu, but in your version of the Bible is called Amos. Amos is the father of Isaiah. And Isaiah and Hosea are contemporaries. So they're rapping about the last days and the gospel of the kingdom at the same time, just like another contemporary of theirs who we may touch today, Micah. So Amos, his father, Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah are all writing to us 
and prophesying at the same period of time. In each one of those books, you will find some scripture, some prophetic utterance pointing to the last day. The last day. Wow. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Chapter 2. Verse 28. So now we're in most certainly one of the most known prophetic books. Daniel. Daniel wrote through six or seven Gentile kings. Daniel is a very profound book. And Daniel, 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 meaning Yah judges or El judges, to be more specific. Don, D-A-N, judge, El. You know, El judges. You know, Yah will judge. So Daniel is written to Israel so Israel can understand the times of the Gentile. Daniel writes through these Gentile kings. He's in occupation. You know, Israel is, is destroyed, basically. You know, we're taken captive in Daniel's book. Very, very profound book. So we've got plenty of time. So I want to touch on these things, right? Not just briefly in bullet points, but I want to touch on these things so you can see a pattern here unfold about the latter days. And, you know, note that we have a complete study coming of the book of Daniel and how it corresponds to the books of Revelation. But Daniel... In this second chapter, in verse 27 and 28, it says, And Daniel answered in the presence of the king, the Nebuchadnezzar, and said to him, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men and the astrologers, the magicians and the soothsayers, cannot be declared to the king. But there is a mighty one, there is El in heaven, who revealeth secrets, and he has made known to Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the last days. Your dream and your vision of upon your head, upon your bed with ease. And so you all know from reading Daniel when we went over it a few weeks ago that he had this dream about the great statue, and the statue was broken down into four metals of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and the, and the toes of that image was of iron and clay. That showed you the beginning at the head, Babylon, and the end where the toes were, Rome, of the times of the Gentiles. Who, us, we, I, we are at the toes of the Gentiles. Why? We didn't go through Babylon as a people. Huh? That's historically. We have gone through who? Medo and Persia, historically. We've gone through Greece, historically. We've gone through ancient Rome. We've gone through, you know, Rome in its final stages of the legs being east and west. And now we're at the very, very end of Rome at some toes. The ten tones of the so-called European economic system or the EU, and when you take the ten toes and you tie it in with the ten horns, with the ten crowns on top of the beast head that rises up out of the water in Revelation 13, that one horn, which is the 11th one that comes up in the middle out of Daniel 7, that's the United States of America. You are in the latter days. And the scripture says that the dream is not really for now, Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 28 says that it will be for the latter days. Latter days. Latter days. If you run the span of this book from Daniel 2.28 all the way to Daniel 10.14, he is dealing specifically with the latter days. The latter days. Turn Daniel 10.14 says this. This is the angel Gabriel speaking to Daniel. He says, now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter day. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. And if you remember in Daniel chapter you know, 10, El, Daniel was praying and he was fasting for those 21 days. He had no food. He had no meat. He had no wine. He didn't even anoint himself at that time for three full weeks that were fulfilled. 
Seven times three is 21. Three weeks completion. He fasted. He put a prayer up. He was waiting to get the answer back, but the prayer hadn't come back as quickly as he actually perceived. Or we know scripturally what? It was delayed. Why? Because Gabriel was wrestling with the prince of Persia, which was a fallen angelic spirit. I'm not talking about Cyrus. I'm not talking about Darius. I'm not talking about the flesh and blood individual. I'm Because Gabriel is not a flesh and blood individual. Gabriel is a spiritual being. Gabriel is a spiritual being, a malik. And he was bringing an answer. Malik is a messenger. He's bringing an answer to the prophet Daniel. But his answer from on high is delayed. Delayed. Why? He tells him why. That in verse 12, from the day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before Yah, the words were heard. I have come to bring you the words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, Mikael, the archangel, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been alone there with the kings of Persia. So what I'm trying to get you to understand as we go through the rest of the prophecies is that every nation on earth has a malik or a angel over it, an angelic being over it. And so the one that was over Persia was the prince of Persia. It had a name. And then he warned him. He said, and I have come. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Then drop down to verse 20 and look what he says. Then he said, do you know why I have come? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. Look at that. So prophetically, he's being told, look, I'm dealing with the Persians here. You've got to deal with Persian Israel. You've got to deal with Persia, which we did. And then after the Persians, the Greeks will come. And I know some of you all watch 300, you know, and Leonidas and Xerxes. That's a movie that touches upon historical things, but they put something in chronological order. And it was even telling you that the prophecies in the Bible are true. They'll put snippets and little bits and pieces in their works. But look at what happens here. Because now the angelic being is who's coming next. And who's coming next was who? Greece. And there was a high spiritual celestial being over Greece. And so if you deal with them, the fallen ones, just like the righteous ones, the fallen ones that come from the hierarchy of the fallen angelic beings, the one that sits over them all is Hashetan, the adversary. But then you're dealing with Sinyaza and Azazel and Asmodeus and Abaddon and Shemael and Lilith and Mastima. And to combat them, the Almighty has seven angels, the seven angels that blow the seven trumpets, the seven seals, and the seven bold judgments are known in biblical writings as, meaning from Enoch, they're known as Mikael, Gabriel, Raphael, Uriel, Phenael, and Serachiel. And then the last one of the seven is Remiel. So we're talking about that you are not wrestling, beloved, with flesh and blood. You are wrestling with powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. And all through the books, are, and if you don't ever read that from Ephesians 6 to know it, my brothers and sisters who refuse to embrace the Besora, then you don't even know, you, you think you're wrestling with flesh and blood. You're angry with that brother. You're angry with that sister. You're angry with America because you are working off the flesh. I'm battling in the spirit. I don't have the power in the flesh to overcome celestial beings or the power of the angelic hierarchy that's fallen demons that sit up over the United States of America. But I know there is a Yah in heaven who sit high and look low, and he has the power, and through your prayer that rises up, his presence comes down. Hallelujah. 
These people, they, they, our people are sitting up talking about the law, the law, the law, and they're just giving letters, lip service. But ain't nobody on that end of Israel delivered nobody who's blind, who's deaf, who's sick, who's lame, the homeless, mm -hmm. those who need shelter. Those ain't nobody praying for those people. But we stand in the gap and we will pray. We will touch and agree together in the spirit. And whatsoever you say and confess and believe in his name shall be done for you. That's what the book said. I'm staying in the book. You got to stay in the book. Daniel in the ninth chapter talks about what was going to happen to us in the latter days. Let's look at the historical context of this first before we go into the latter parts of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel gives us something specific, very specific. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. Talking about end time prophecy. Whenever you're talking about end time prophecy, You've got to associate the end of our captivity with the end time prophecy. <laughs> and so just to give you an example of the close of a captivity, because we're at a close of this captivity. Let's look at a previous captivity to show you the accuracy of the word of Yah. Daniel 9, 1 says, in the first year of Darius, or Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, stop. You need to write there in the margin, he came to power in 537 BC. 537 BC. So you just write 537 BC and then put you a little ad sign and then write the number 70 next to it. It says, in the first year of his reign, First of his reign, 537 B.C., I, Daniel, understood by the books, plural, the number of years specified by the word of Yahweh through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the destruction or desolation of Jerusalem. Mark that down. Daniel lives after Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesies before Daniel. He's citing Jeremiah. That's what Daniel is doing. Daniel is searching from the book of Yah and reading, as it says in Isaiah 34, 16. He's not giving his own opinion. He's not quoting from a going to the scriptures. So let's go where he went. Jeremiah 25, 10 and 11 and Jeremiah 29 and 10. Let's see what Daniel was reading when he was reading, which gave him the understanding. This is what Daniel was reading. 25, 10 and 11. And it's very important because Daniel is going to make mention of a prophetic event and then the close of an age or a close of a period of captivity. But these are things that were written that were going to occur. And it reads this way. Moreover, I will take from them, meaning Israel, the voice of mirror and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. I'd circle that if I were you. The sound of the millstone and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall become a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. 70 years. Jeremiah 29. Now wait till you all get there. I hear somebody turning their pages. Hallelujah. Don't want to leave nobody. Jeremiah, Yeremiyahu, right? Go in here. 29 and 10. It says, For thus saith Yahweh, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and shall cause you to return to this 
place. Look at that. After 70 years, not after 69, and most certainly they ain't got to wait to 71. After 70 years, I will visit you when they are complete. That's how one scripture reads. I'm going to reread it this way. After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work or word towards you and cause you to return to this place. Back to, Jerem uh, back to Daniel 9. So Daniel is reading the scroll of Yirmiyahu, the prophet, and he tells you in the, and, in the first year of 537 B.C., it said, I understood by the books the number of years, what number? 70, specified by the word of Yahweh through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the destruction or the desolation of Jerusalem. Now look what he does. The first thing he does in verse 3 is he sets his face toward Yah to make a request by prayer, supplication, fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. He prays. He confesses. He pours out his spirit. He asks Yah to forgive him, and he asks Yah to forgive us, his people. And what happens is Yah hears his prayer. Because when you go into the fifth chapter, did you hear what I said? Yeah, when you go to the fifth chapter of Daniel, in the last part, which we'll touch on today, you will find out that we did begin to go home after Belshazzar's failed party, which happens. And then you must then ask yourself, beloved, why then if the events of chapter 5 of Daniel happen after Daniel 9 and 10, are they written in that particular way? Because they're written that way, and they're actually, the pages are out of chronological, historical, biblical order. The enemy did that to confuse you. Because you've been taught that 5 and 6 and 7 come after 6 and 5. But I'm telling you, the events that are in Daniel chapter 5, when you read it and you put the kings together, because that's your historical footnote, you've got to put the kings in the historical order, chronologically that they appear, then the book will have greater meaning and understanding to you. Because the Gentiles purposefully put these chapters out of order. And they are out of order. They're out of order. There's nothing wrong with the book. There's something wrong with this book. The book is pristine. And so Daniel's giving you a hint that at 70 years, we come up out of captivity in Babylon and we return it home. As you read through Daniel, right? And Daniel's very clear on biblical prophecy. You know, outside of Isaiah, his prophetic utterances are pristine for Israel. Pristine. When you look, the 70 years ended at the 537 mark. Some say 539. You know, it depends on which historian you look at, which research you do. But Daniel chapter 5, right? Look at Daniel chapter 5 now. It's the last days. All this stuff is tied into the last days. Daniel chapter 5. And you'll watch because Nebuchadnezzar, then his son, Nebuchadnezzar, then his son, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, came to power. And his grandson's name was Belshazzar. Belshazzar was the one who had the feast for thousands and thousands of his people and lords in this fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. It's a pretty lengthy chapter. We don't have time to go through the whole chapter today. Just want to touch on excerpts that continue with the teaching today and the thought. And it says in verse 5, In the same hour, fingers of man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw it a part of the hand that wrote. You all know this story. You know this story. Then verse 21 of the same chapter reads this way. Then he was driven from the sons of men. This is Daniel talking about Nebuchadnezzar when he was driven away out of the kingdom and he went and 
walked around like a beast. Look at that phrase. The first king of the Gentile empires was referred to in the books of Daniel chapter 4 as a beast. And so when Daniel is having this conversation with his grandson, Belshazzar, he says, Then he, Nebuchadnezzar, was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like a beast. And his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that Yahweh, or the Most High El, El Elyon, rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whom he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And you have lifted yourself up against Yah of heaven. Pride is here. And your people have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your choice lords and your wives and your concubines, you have drunken wine from the vessels. 